Um, keeping in mind, I know that we have a lot traveling this week. It's 4th of July week, so we are going to jump right in and get going this morning. So go to the Lord with me in prayer before we get started. Lord, we thank You so much again for this time that we have this morning to come together and worship You. We're just so thankful for everything that You give us, all the blessings that we have every day. We're thankful for the freedoms that we have to come and worship You. We know that that's not our hope in this life. It's not the things that we have here on earth, but we're just grateful for them every day. And there's so many people around the world that just don't understand what that's like. Have to go underground to have church or can't have the freedoms that we do and we take it for granted. We're just so thankful for that. For those that we have that are on vacation or traveling or family events or whatever today, we just pray that you'll be with them, keep them safe, bring them back to us next week if that's your will. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me back to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. As we uh, took a week off of it last week and uh, listened to a great sermon by uh, Rick Morton from Lifeline. So so good to hear from him. Uh, Such a great organization. Happy to be partnering with them to be helping out families, uh, children and women especially, but families in general. Uh, reunification of foster families, getting families involved in adoption and foster care and all kinds of different things, just doing great work around the state of Alabama. And we're so thankful that we're able to give to them and be a part of that. It was great to hear from them and uh, just know all that they're doing. And their heart is in ministry and ministering to women and to families and and doing the best that we can to help these women and children in, in this broken environment that we find ourselves in today. But as we come back to chapter 13 of Revelation, um, two weeks ago, uh, we looked at the first beast in chapter 13. We're not going to go back through all that, but I do want to do a little bit of a recap as we talked about the Antichrist. We saw the Antichrist revealed. uh, And he comes out of the sea, and it says he has ten horns and seven heads. And I'm not going to read all that, but if we go to chapter 17, that is not explained to us right here in the direct context Uh, We went back to Daniel chapter 7 and talked about um, all the things and all the pictures of the ten horns and things that that gives us. But if we look at chapter 17, and we'll be there in a few weeks, we see a little bit more about this. uh, I think it's starting in verse 9. So he's talking about the, the great prostitute and the beast. In verse 9, he says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads, and remember there's seven heads on this beast, are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. And the woman, and we'll talk about it more when we get there, represents all of the evil religious systems that will be in the world during that time. And the mountains represent the governments. So the seven heads are the seven governments which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, seven kings ruling seven kingdoms, five of whom have fallen. Now remember, John is writing in the context of his present day, and he hears this, five of kings have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. So he's talking about five historical kingdoms that have already passed. And if we go throughout history, we see the Egyptians, we see the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and then the Greeks. That was the five worldwide kingdoms that existed up until John's day. And then it says, one is, that's the Roman Empire, obviously. And then it says, one is yet to come. So this beast, and we talked about this last week, represents all of the kingdoms throughout history. And also the kingdoms that will exist in that day. It's a representation of all of those things. The Antichrist represents all of these kingdoms because he is the ruler, the leader of all those kingdoms. Throughout history, it has been Satan that has been in control. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's been the power behind so many earthly kingdoms throughout history. That's why we've seen so much evil done through them. And then in the Antichrist day, he will be ultimately in charge of the entire world wide kingdom and that's what we're going to see a little bit more of today so we see this beast coming out of the sea and it's not a literal beast that comes out of the sea it's a picture of something when the antichrist comes on the scene he's not going to look like a seven-headed dragon nobody's going to follow a seven-headed dragon 
demons and Satan always present themselves as angels of light. He's going to come bringing peace and prosperity and all these good things. That's what people want to follow. That's what people look for today. And that's what He's going to bring. So He's going to have this following. But what John sees is His character. That He is this beast that comes on the scene. And He's given this power from the dragon. The dragon being Satan. We saw that in chapter 12. So it's all building up to that. We have the dragon. Then we have the first beast. The first beast gets his power from the dragon. The first beast, the Antichrist, gets his power from Satan. In verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled and they followed the beast. So, he's killed. And we'll see more confirmation of that as we go through the rest of this chapter. But the Antichrist is killed. And then, his mortal wound is healed. He rises from the dead. That's the only thing that a mortal wound being healed can mean is being risen from the dead. And of course, this Antichrist is the one who has killed these two witnesses. Remember the two witnesses that were causing all this havoc on the world. They had been protecting the nation of Israel. They had been getting the negative credit for all these bad things that had been happening on the world. They had had power to call down fire and to breathe out fire, it says, to destroy those that would come against them. And all the bad things, all the horrors that were coming on the world, they had the power to do those things and they were being blamed for it and nobody could kill them. Nobody could touch them. But the Antichrist comes along and he kills them. And so it says the whole world followed him and marveled at him because of what he had done. Now, think of it this way. We look at this picture and we see this is the Antichrist. We know who this character is. And we don't think that it would be logical to follow this kind of a person, right? I mean, you see a seven-headed dragon coming out of the sea with ten horns on its head and crowns, and he's getting his power from Satan. And you say, who would follow him? But remember, that's not what they're seeing. They're seeing a man who's brought peace to the world. They're seeing a man who has come against these two guys that nobody could touch, who was wreaking havoc on the world. Now, this is a judgment of God coming onto the world. But it was coming through these two prophets. A lot of it was anyway. They had the power to bring these plagues, it says, anytime they wanted to. And nobody could do anything about it. So they're getting the credit for all these bad things that are happening on the world. This is hell on earth. And it's because of these two guys the world sees. And then here comes someone who kills them and stops all these things from happening. So that's what the world sees. An answer to their worldly prayers essentially. So they all follow Him. And here's what they say. After His mortal wound is healed, after He has been killed, and after He rises from the dead, we don't know how this happens. It doesn't tell us what happens to Him. Now we know that He kills the two witnesses. And they rise from the dead, and they ascend into heaven. Remember they have a party, they give presents to one another and all these things while they're laying in the streets for three and a half days. And then they rise from the dead and everybody's terrified because they're back. But then they ascend into heaven. And we don't know what happens to the Antichrist. We don't know how he dies. But as we'll see, I believe what we see here is him dying and him being indwelled by Satan. So they worshipped the dragon. Verse 4, For he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who can fight against it? He has now ultimate power. On earth, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, so he's speaking out against God. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemy against God, blasphemy in the name of his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it is allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth worshiped it. Every one whose name had not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So when the, the, the result of all the things that He's done now, He's brought peace to the world, essentially. And we may not see that clearly here, but remember all the things that have been happening. Now those things stop. And He's put an end to sacrifice and grain offering in the temple. He's going to seat Himself in the temple and require that the whole world worship Him as God. But he's brought peace. He's ended all these things. This is a counterfeit. 
This is what the world was looking for. They wanted a Savior. They wanted an earthly king. Remember when Jesus, I think it was when He cast out the demons out of the demoniac and they tried to make Him king by force. And He fed the multitudes and they came and they wanted more. They didn't want to hear about the Gospel. They wanted their fleshly desires fulfilled. And that's who they wanted to be, the king. Well, the Antichrist comes and he gives them that. Because all these horrible things are happening. And verse 8 says, And all who dwell on the earth worshipped it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So there's a, there's a loophole there. It says everyone on the earth worships the beast except the ones whose names have been written from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when He talks about this time that's to come, um, He says in Matthew 24, starting at verse 15, we, we've read this many, many times when He talks about the abomination of desolation. He's talking about this time. He's talking about Israel fleeing into the wilderness and there they're going to be protected and nourished for 1260 days and that's where Israel is at the midpoint of tribulation which is where we find ourselves. Uh, but if we, if we skip down, that starts in verse 15 of 24. If we skip down a little bit and we come to um, verse 24 of chapter 24 and He says this, Jesus says, For false Christ." And false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. If possible, even the elect. It's not possible. And that's what John is saying here. That he's going to lead everyone astray. Everyone is going to worship him. Except the elect. Those whose names have been written. And this would prompt a response by many people to say, well, so you believe in predestination? And I said, well, it's what it says. It says, your name has been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. Does that mean that the book existed from the foundation of the world? Does it mean that your name was written there from the foundation of the world? Yeah, both. That's what it says. We say, well, that, that's not fair. I want my name to be written in the book from the foundation of the world. Well, follow Jesus. Well, I don't want to follow Jesus when your name's not there. Well, that's not fair. I want my name to be there. Then follow Jesus. See, it's not my fault. We should be thankful for this because look, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then your name is written. And if it were possible, Jesus said, everyone would be led astray. But because we have been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we can't be led astray. That doesn't mean we don't fail. It doesn't mean we don't sin. We certainly do every day. Most of us do. I do, anyway. I don't know about you. Maybe you're a little better than me. But He can't destroy our faith. And as we see going through Revelation, He destroys everything else. But He can't destroy our faith. And the only reason He can't destroy our faith is because it's not of our own work. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's by grace, through faith. Not of our own work, so that no one can boast. So we should be thankful for that. If it were up to me, I would mess it up. I try all the time. But it's not up to me. It's back to Revelation 13. The whole world whose name is not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world is following and worshiping the Antichrist. In verse 10, it says, If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he must be slain. That's God's sovereignty during this time. If anyone's to be taken captive, he's going to be taken captive. It's not our job to fight back with swords and guns and whatever it is against people persecuting our faith. And again, I talked about this last week. It doesn't mean if somebody breaks in your house, you don't protect yourself. It doesn't mean if somebody's trying to harm your children, you don't protect yourself. But we don't evangelize with weapons like so many other religions try to do. There's no conquest of Christianity. It doesn't work. It's not the way hearts and lives and minds are changed, right? We don't beat the enemy in subjection. 
We submit even to punishment from our enemies if it comes against our faith. Jesus went willingly, remember, to the cross. So did all the apostles. Went willingly to their death. But this is just a reminder here in verse 10 that God is sovereign. He's in control. If anyone wants to be taken captive, it's going to happen. If anyone's going to be slain with a sword, he's going to be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Knowing that God's in control. Uh, chapter 25, again, of back in Matthew, Matthew 24. When, when Jesus is talking about uh, I didn't, I didn't underline this, but when he says, "Oh, here it is," uh, chapter twenty-five, uh, verse forty-one, when we talks about the judgment time when people come to judgment, and this is talking about the time after this is the final judgment. He starts talking about in verse thirty-one, and he's going to judge people based on their faith. And some people are going to say, "Hey, listen, I did all these good things in your name," and he's going to say, "Depart from me, for I never knew you." Right. And then there's going to be this other group. Verse 41, he says, then, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And that, that's the one that said, You know, I said I was hungry and you didn't give me anything. I said I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything. He's talking about this time of tribulation. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison. You didn't visit me. This tells us how bad this time is going to be for those that are believers and by association, those that help those believers also have faith. They don't receive it by their action, but their action is evidence of their faith, right? Right? Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or stranger, naked, sick, in prison, and didn't minister to you? Then we will answer saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So when we see this person hurting, struggling, hungry, sick, and we just ignore that. Now he's talking about this time of tribulation here. But it applies today. Now, I'm not saying that you give every person on the side of the street money that comes by. And we have to obviously be careful and diligent about the way we handle those things. But understand that you just never know. Remember, back in Genesis, in Hebrews, talking about the time of Genesis, when, when the angels came and visited Abraham, Hebrews says, during that time, many have been visited by angels without even knowing it. But, but backing up just a little bit there, the king will say to those on his right, 34, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's, that's that language again. From the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you sick and hungry and feed you? And thirsty and gave you drink, and when did we see you a stranger and welcome you in and naked and clothe you? And he will and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to the least of these of my brothers. Recognize that, my brothers. You did it to me. So he's talking about those Christians during this time of tribulation who are going to be sick and hungry, because we're going to see in a few minutes that they're not going to be able to buy food. And he says, you did that to those people. And we see missionaries, and not even missionaries. We see people in, in China and Venezuela and in Cuba and North Korea and you know, Northern Africa and all these other places around the world who are unable to have any kind of social life or are unable oftentimes to get food. They're persecuted to the point of death, and there are those that help them. It's like the Underground Railroad you know, in the United States during slavery, right? It's kind of the same thing. There's evil in the world, but there are those who would go behind the scenes to help those people. Not seeking recognition, not wanting some kind of glory for it, but serving God through serving others. 
So, verse 11. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to bring a level of world peace. He's going to bring peace. And he's going to fix all the world's problems. He's going to fix this national identity problem that we have. You know, nations, you know, borders, you know, there's always fighting over these things. He's going to fix those problems. Then the false prophet is going to fix all the nation, all the world's religious problems. All this fighting that there is over different religions. Remember, the church is gone at this point. Israel is gone. They're being kept in the wilderness, being protected. So what, what's left? There are those believers, but they're not prominent, right? They're not making themselves known because they're being persecuted. So then you have the Hindus, you have the Muslims, you have the atheists. There won't be any atheists anymore. They're going to pick a side. So how do you reconcile this? Well, that's what the false prophet's going to do. The Antichrist came and he fixed all the world's physical problems. The false prophet's going to come fix all the world's religious problems. He's been given by God the authority to exercise all wonders in front of the Antichrist. Let's look at verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. The first one came out of the sea. This one's coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who do not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both great and small, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has an understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Very familiar. At least parts of this passage should be very familiar to you. We've seen this number 666 throughout history. Ever since this was written, you know, people look at all these different things. What, what does this mean? What is the mark of the beast, right? You know, when credit cards came out, that's the mark of the beast. You know, vaccines, that was the mark of the beast. You know, and it's just been, there's been so many different things that are the mark of the beast. Well, this is where all that comes from. And you see, you know, these, some of these heavy metal bands and stuff used to use that kind of numbers on, on different things just to kind of for shock value, I think. But it all comes from this. This is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So first, John sees another beast rising out of the earth. He looks like a lamb. Now, Jesus is represented as a lamb, right? I mean, we saw that when we saw the lamb in heaven. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But now John sees this other beast rising out of the earth. Remember the hordes of demons that came, the scorpions stinging, you know, the armies that came, they all came out of the earth, right? And then the Antichrist comes out of the sea. For a Jew, anything that was in the ocean was bad. They did not like the water. So they call that the abyss, the abusos, the, the bottomless. They didn't know there was a bottom to the ocean. They thought it just went down forever to infinity. And they hated it. They were terrified of it. They were not seagoing people like the Phoenicians were. And there's the story of Jonah. You know, obviously we're all familiar with that. So this, this other beast, he comes, comes out of the earth. And it had two horns like, notice the language, like a lamb. So it's not a lamb. He had two horns like a lamb. And it spoke like, like a dragon. So don't think of a, of, a, of a little lamb breathing fire. That's not what's going on here. He has two horns. Again, these are, these are character images. These are pictures that mean something different. It's not a lamb breathing fire. This is a man. This is a human. This is a person. 
And He rises out of the earth in horns. Horns represent authority. We've talked about that in pretty good detail leading up to this. Horns represent authority. But He speaks, so, he, so He's able to speak, and He speaks like a dragon. Now, we just got done talking about a dragon. Who is the dragon? The dragon is Satan. This is the mouthpiece of Satan. This is the false prophet. He's not named the false prophet here necessarily, but we will see that he will be named that. We've seen him called that. Uh, this is the first mention of him. There's nothing in Daniel about the false prophet. Jesus doesn't directly mention him as far as I know. This is the first understanding we have of this false prophet. But there have been, just like Jesus said, there will come false Christ and false prophets throughout history. We have seen these kinds of things. Religious systems set themselves up to look like this because they're trying to imitate Christ. And that's what this is. The Trinity. This is a false Trinity because you had Satan, right? Then you had his offspring, the Antichrist. Now you have the false prophet. It's a false Trinity. And religious systems have done that throughout history because they're all led by Satan. He tries to counterfeit the truth. He doesn't have an original thought. He was a liar from the beginning, but he's so close to the truth that it makes a lie believable. Just like when he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. What do you tell him? If you eat this, you'll be like God. Well, there's nothing wrong with the fruit. The fruit was fine. It was the sin that was the problem. And then they did know good from evil. So he's like a lamb. He's a false teacher. He has authority. But look, it exercises, verse 12, all authority of the first beast. So it has the authority of the Antichrist. It's been given all of this authority and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Again, we talked about this. Why do I believe that when one of the seven heads was wounded and came back to life, that it was him being killed and resurrected? Here we see the first beast, it says, his mortal wound, a mortal wound is his death, was healed. Verse 13, speaking about the false prophet again. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. It is able, it has the authority... And by the signs, it is allowed. Again, it is allowed. It has no authority on its own. Keep recognizing that in the language. It is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It can only do it in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived. Again, language again. He was wounded by the sword. And live. So we see the false prophet here. He is the sidekick of the Antichrist. And he has authority. The authority is given to him. He has no authority on his own, just like Satan has no authority on his own. The Antichrist has no authority on his own. It's all allowed by God. Today we can look and see false teachers everywhere. This is nothing new. Jesus said this would happen. They put on these shows and act like they're healing. We see this on TV, you know. Remember the Benny, I'm sure he still does it, Benny Hinn, you know, he'd take his jacket and knock people over with it and all, all these different kinds of things. And at the same time, there were kids in the back with cancer in a wheelchair who had been lied to and their parents told them, maybe this will help. He heals people on TV. He cures all these sicknesses. Let's go. Maybe there's hope. But they're left at the back of the room. If you've watched the American Gospel, Costi Hinn, Benny's nephew, talks about this. That he was part of it. He was a catcher. He was one of the ones that would catch people when they fall down. And then he came to know Jesus and he said, it's all a sham. It's all a lie. But they flocked to him by the millions. That's a false prophet. You know, Kenneth Copeland's worth $700 million. There's good money in being a false prophet. Joel Osteen. You know, name dropping these people because they deserve it. That's what they do. They lead people astray. Name it and claim it. If you just believe enough, it'll go away. You'll get all your problems solved. I've had people in my family come to Christ and I believe it was a legitimate conversion 
And they follow people like this. And as soon as they don't get the promises fulfilled, they fall off the wagon. Because it's a false promise that can never deliver. They're evil. They are the false prophets. They are the anti-Christ. And we see it all over the place. Just imagine now. But they, there's no legitimate healing in any of these things. None of it's true. It's all false. It's all fake. It's all made up. But here we see this false prophet. He has authority. People flock to them by the millions and they do nothing but make empty promises. Imagine what's going to happen when a false prophet has authority. And it says he can perform signs and wonders and miracles. You don't think people are going to follow that? This is not a far-fetched idea. It shouldn't surprise us at all. People will do anything almost today to get their problems solved, to get you know, sicknesses taken care of, financial problems taken care of. He has authority of the beast in His presence. It says He makes fire come down from heaven. And He commands them to build an image to the beast and worship it. To worship the image. So, idolatry now is going to be commanded. It's not technically idolatry. This is building a graven image. They're, They're very, very similar. A graven image is a representation of something else. You know, that's what Nebuchadnezzar made, made, made them do, was build this, uh, this golden image to worship it as a god. That was an idol. The golden calf that the nation of Israel built at the bottom of Mount Sinai was an idol because they were worshiping it. But the Ten Commandments also says don't make a graven image. A graven image would be an image of something else. So not the god itself, but a representation of it. So that's what we see here. Make an image of the beast and worship the image. So it's a combination of both of those things. I know that's kind of a blurry gray line, but we can just say they're breaking both of those Ten Commandments right there. So he commands them to build this image to the beast and worship it. If possible, Jesus said, even the elect would be led astray, but it's not possible. All who refuse... will be killed. All who refuse. So now, in our society today, in our very secular society, we see veiled and different, uh, you know, not, not overt Satan worship. You know, we know you're either led by Christ or you're led by Satan. There's, there's no in between. But it's very veiled. It's very, you know, kind of stealthy in our society sometimes. And it comes through as an angel of light. Just like these false prophets, these false teachers. And you have the gospel get watered down. You have the church go into liberalism because they steer away from the Bible because it's not relevant to so many people today. When this time happens, it's going to be clear. Worship the beast or die. That's the option. Verse 15, And it was allowed... to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Now, this idol, this graven image, is going to be able to speak and have its own breath. That's a a miracle people are going to see. But it's satanic. They've been drawn into this. But now they can't go back. It also causes all, verse 16, all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave. There's no discrimination here. Everyone to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. So what we're going to have left over after the church is gone, after Israel is essentially out of the way, at least for the moment, you're going to have these religious systems that are going to have to be brought together. And they have to worship something. That's what religion does, right? It worships. You know, you, people call themselves secularists or atheists or humanists or whatever, but they worship. 
They worship themselves. They worship institutions. They worship trees, the planet, whatever it might be. Save the whales. I don't know. They're worshiping something. I'm not against saving whales. But they worship something. They worship the creation instead of the Creator. So to reconcile all that, to fulfill these people's needs, we are worshipers by nature. God made us that way. The false prophet says, here's all you need to worship now. He solved all the world's problems, right? I mean, this is a time of peace now. I mean, we've come through this three and a half year period of horror. And the second half of tribulation is going to be worse. But right now there's a pause. Because these two prophets, these two witnesses have been killed. Israel's out of the way now. They're gone. I think maybe, and this is just my personal view on this, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Research it yourself. I think we might be looking at something like a like the Antichrist, maybe a Muslim, maybe, because he comes out of that area of the world. Very the, the Middle East. Once Israel's gone, what's left? It's the Arab world, right? That's all that's left there. So maybe he comes out of that, and the false prophet, you know, he's maybe what's left over of the church that was not truly Christian. And so they, maybe they have this agreement together that they have peace with one another. And now he, sits, he seats himself in the Holy of Holies, declares himself to be God, and declares that the world must come and sacrifice to him and worship him. And if not, death. Great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, everyone. And how do we know that this is going to that they're doing these things. They're either going to be marked, it says, on their right hand or their forehead. Now, throughout history, there have been things kind of like this that have happened. There have been things during, during the Roman Empire. There was Caesar, work, Caesar worship, right? And in so many different places, and we talked about that when we looked at Corinthians and Ephesus and different places like that, if you didn't go and sacrifice to the Caesar and get your little card saying that you had sacrificed to Caesar, you were not able to be part of the trade guilds. You couldn't do business. You couldn't have the things that you needed to survive. So this is not new. But here there's going to be a mark. A mark put on either the right hand or the forehead. Maybe you can pick. I don't know. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So this mark is going to be out in the open. This is going to be clear. This is not a microchip implant. Because you couldn't even prove you had that, right? This is going to be a mark so you can show people, look, I worship the beast. I got the mark on my forehead. Now I can do business. You can sell me food. I can feed my family. And how tempting is that going to be? When you look at your children, not you, we're not going to be here. When somebody looks at their children starving to death and there's food sitting there and they say, all you got to do is worship the beast. What's it going to hurt? He brought peace to the world. Why would you not? It was those two witnesses and the Jews that were following Yahweh that were causing all the problems. And by the way, I don't think the false prophet is going to be the only one killing people. Because remember, all this is tied to God, to Jesus. They are the evil ones now the world is going to see. And we see that in our world today in ways, don't we? You know, we're the hateful ones. We're the bigots. We're the evil ones. We're the ones that you know, are looking at a 2,000-year-old document and saying that it's true. When Antichrist comes and he wipes out the two witnesses who are causing all this evil in the world, and he says, get them, all their followers. It's all their fault. They'll be happy to do it. So it's not that far-fetched of an idea. But there's going to be a mark. And I believe this is a literal mark. I believe you're going to be, not you, I'm going to quit using that language. I believe the people that are here during this time, there's going to be a branding iron or a tattoo or something like that is going to be put on them so that it's going to be clear. There's no riding a fence anymore. You're picking a side. And it's how you're able to feed yourself. That's why when Jesus said in Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was in prison. We were put in prison. 
When you came to visit me, I was sick. I was naked and you clothed me. They're not going to have nothing. They're not even going to be able to eat. They're not going to have water. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So 666, very famous. Everybody knows 666. The number 6, it says right here, is the number of a man. It is the number of fallen man throughout Scripture. The number 6 represents fallen man man throughout scripture when you in hebrew when you multiply something it you know seven times seven and then seven times 77 the more the more you multiply something the more extreme it becomes right so six is the number of fallen man if you had two sixes it would just be that multiplied and then the ultimate would be three that's why when when peter said how many times can it be forgiven seven times and jesus said seven times 77 meaning infinitely It's not meant to be an exact number, but here we see this number is 666 because this is the ultimate fallen man. This is Satan indwelled a man. And that's what the number, that's where it comes from. Now in Hebrew, this is lost to us in English um, because we don't have numbers associated with our letters in English, but in Hebrew, each letter, each Hebrew letter is associated with a number. If I can remember my Hebrew alphabet, Olive Bait, Gimel Dalet, Hey Vav Zion, Hey Tet Yo Kav, Laman Bay Noon, Samakan Pei, Sadeko Frey Shin Tav. That's the Hebrew alphabet. That's the one thing I learned in seminary. <laughs> You're supposed to sing it with an alphabet song, but y'all don't want to hear that, trust me. But the first 10 numbers, I believe, are 1 through 10. And then it goes 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, up to 100, the next 10. And then the final three, there's, um, I think there's 23 or 20, but then it goes to hundreds after that. So the only language that you can take numbers, or I'm sorry, you can take letters, and you can add those letters up, and you can get a number out of them, is Hebrew. You don't do it in Greek, you don't do it in English, you don't do it in Spanish, any other language, but Hebrew. Jesus' name, Yahshua. In, in Hebrew, when you add the numbers up, it means Jesus the Messiah, the number is 749. 7, 7 times 7. So they have, they have meaning. They mean things. So you can't look at this today and say, oh, his, his, his name adds up to be 666. He must be the Antichrist because it can be an infinite number of names that could add up to this. The only people who will ever be able to figure this out will be the people who are living in the time. And they see this person come on board and he's doing all these things and then they see his name in Hebrew and it is added up to 666. They say, that's the one. But who would know to do that? Jews. Those who know Hebrew. So when Jesus gives this message about when you see these things happen, flee to the mountains, and they start to see these things happen, and this person comes on board, all happens at the same time, and they say, that's Him. That's the one Jesus talked about. That's the one John wrote about because they're worshiping Yahweh at this point. These are true believing Jews. And they say, that's the one. It's time to get out of Dodge. This is a message to them. So don't worry about is my visa card because you know V is V I is six you know in Roman numerals and you know whatever you know, it's, people come up with all kinds of stuff or you know there was people who said that Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter both they kind of came up and added up their names and it's like all right, we're getting a little ridiculous on some of this stuff you know you might not want to have a visa card it's probably not a good financial decision you know but it's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast will be either this man's name or the number 666. I really believe that will be tattooed on these people. And he has all authority. And God has given him all of this authority. There's an erosion of truth, I believe, in the church. I believe the world looks at us and says, you still believe what the Bible says. It's outdated. It's irrelevant anymore. And so often the church just abides by that and says, well, we're going to change our beliefs to make sure that the world doesn't get upset with us because we want to fit in, right? We don't need to change our beliefs to make the world like us. Jesus said, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. should be a good sign when the world doesn't like us. 
And we don't go out, obviously, trying to make enemies. The church today is so full of false gospel. You don't see a message about sin or repentance or hell from any of these people. It's not a popular message. That's why they had to turn the Astrodome into a church because people flock to see that stuff. Because it sounds good. It gives them what they want. Remember when Jesus, when He fed the multitudes and He said, I'll give you the bread of life. And they say, no, give us some more food. Show us a sign that we might believe you when He had just fed 30,000 people out of nothing. They don't want to see that. They don't want to hear repent and believe in the gospel. They want their physical needs fulfilled. And one day somebody's going to come, it's going to fill their physical needs, and he's going to be the Antichrist. And the world's not going to know it because they're going to get everything they've ever wanted. And that's a popular message today. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's a liar from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's never had an original thought. He told Adam and Eve in the garden if they would just listen to him instead of the Word of God, that they would have their problem solved. It would unlock their full potential, right? It's the same message we hear today. If you just do what you want, if you just live your true self, you know, your truth or whatever it is, and ignore what God has to say to you, then you'll have all the things that you need. Don't be held back by that. We love the sinner and pray for those who persecute us, but we don't join them, right? Bow your heads and close your eyes. People today want to say the Bible's outdated and irrelevant. It's because they want to worship themselves. They're being led astray. And I don't think it's ever been more relevant than it is today. So if we just look at all the evil that's going on in the name of righteousness, without the truth, we're imprisoned by lies. But remember, if we know the truth, the truth will make us free. That's why we teach the Bible here. It's how we know God. People say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in that Bible. Then you don't know God. It is His Word. It's living and active. It never changes. We're looking at Revelation. It's, when people are there during that time, it's going to be unavoidable. There's no subtlety. They worship Satan or they die. We don't want people to be in that situation. You won't be able to buy food without a mark. I think it's a clear mark, like I said. So we say, is, is, is this person alive today? Maybe. He's not been revealed. People always want to speculate about who this person is and what he's going to look like and what he's going to do, but the Bible makes it clear. The world's looking for an earthly leader to give them the desires of their flesh, and one day he's going to come. And he's going to give them what they want, and it's going to cost them everything. Don't look for a world leader to make everything right. God's given us His Word. Follow it. It's all we need. There's nothing out there to give us all the things we need. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all empty promises. It may give short-term relief. The only thing that can give us healing is the Gospel. We're all broken. And Jesus came into my life and He healed me. And He's still working on me. But one day I'm going to be perfect. And so are you if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank You so much for saving us. We don't deserve it. Thank You for giving us Your Word and that it never changes. We pray, Lord, that those that don't know You won't have to experience this, but they'll come to knowledge of salvation before it's too late. For all the people that are going to be celebrating and enjoying their time together tomorrow, we just thank You for that time of celebration. We thank You for family and friends and food and all those different things, God, but we know as good as that can be and as many hopes as we have in this world, none of them can compare to the eternal hope we have in You. Let us don't ever forget that. Keep us safe if that's Your will. Bring us back safely next week if that's Your will. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.